You're tuned in to to the the Trial Trial Technology Technology and Litigation Litigation Support Support Podcast. Podcast. Sit back and enjoy interviews with industry leaders as we discuss everything from new trends to old war stories. Interested in being a guest on the podcast? Contact us on Twitter at Trial Tech Cast. And welcome in to another week of the Litigation Support and Trial Technology Podcast. I'm Rob Hilt, your host, and I want to apologize for not dropping a podcast last week, but uh, I have received many emails. Uh, I even got a card in the mail uh, about the Mount Rushmore podcast with Tim Piganelli, Ted Brooks, Richard Katz, and Rob Rosenberg. And I, I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the uh, outpouring of people that are actually listening to this and, and getting some benefit from the podcast. And so I decided to let that one play an extra week uh, before we put another one up. Plus, my schedule has been incredibly hectic. As I've said before, I've got a month-long trial coming up, and Sunday I had a whirlwind tour up to New York City for 24 hours and then back to Memphis, where it is currently, I think, 115 degrees outside. Uh, That is with the heat index. And so it is brutally hot. And... So I thought, well, it's time to drop another podcast, and my guest today that I'm bringing on, we are going to talk about yet another trial presentation software that has come out on the market. And this show is unbiased, uh, certainly unscripted, and I give everybody their due. Uh, Even if I don't particularly endorse or like your product, that's not what this show's about. It doesn't matter what I like. Somebody out there likes it, and I give people the platform to come on and talk about it. I got an interesting email uh, the other day from iPro, uh, which, you know, I had Kim Taylor on the show. I got an interesting email from iPro that said you're receiving a UPS uh, shipment that's supposed to come on Tuesday, which is today, uh, that apparently just from talking to some folks, they are sending me some swag. Now, I am a swag fan. If your company has shirts, hats, buttons, little confetti poppers, pens, pencils, anything of that nature, if it's got your company logo on it, I take all comers when it comes to swag because A, it's free, and B, I find use in some of that stuff. And what I don't like, I can give to my wife, who is an accountant, and she has a a desk job, and she'll take little things like that and set them up on their desk, whatever they are. So if you have swag, shameless deal here, send it to me. I, I, you know, I'm I'm all about the advertising. I don't have any swag. My only swag is, of course, the podcast. As I said in the open, uh, oh, oh, and lastly, before I get any further, the audio on the Mount Rushmore show. I went back and listened to it, and I was very, very displeased with the audio. Uh, I was fine with the other guys. I know Rob was having some technical problems, but he got that fixed like a good trial tech would, and um, the audio on my end was absolutely horrible. I sounded like I was in a coffee can, and I couldn't figure out what was going on because I use a Zoom H5 mic, and What had happened was I had my webcam turned on at the time so the guys could see me and, you know, we could talk. And I was actually going through the mic on my webcam, which was about three to four feet away from me. And so I was off in the distance. Uh, That was not good. And so I apologize for my audio. I will try to not let that happen again. As I said a minute ago, there is a new software on the market. It's called Lemony. For those of you listening to this podcast, you know what a motion in Lemony is. The Latin term for limit or strike or get rid of. And this company has been tweeting uh, for a while about the release of this software, Lemony. The company is Logistec, spelled L-E-G-I-S-T-E-K. T is in Tom. And according to their website, they are not just a legal software company. They're a legal solutions company. 
Their new product, Lemony, is an integrated evidence presentation platform usable across tablets, laptops, classic PCs, and even devices like the 84-inch Microsoft Surface Hub. All of that intrigued me because they're not going iPad, they're not going PC, they're not going, they're going everywhere. They're crossing platform. And actually, they're crossing medium because platform would be on the iOS. So I started to take a look at their software and I got in contact with Peter Moore. And Peter Moore had posted on one of the, uh, one of the posts that we had on LinkedIn, he had posted a comment about the barcode scanner thing. And uh, right up front, he said, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm plugging my software to you. And I thought, wow, you know, the guy's coming out here. He's telling us he's going to plug his software. So I decided to check it out and take a look at it. Uh, Peter is our guest today. Yeah, Peter's an attorney. He's the leader of Logistech. He's the creator of Lemony. He's been practicing in Chicago as a trial attorney for over 10 years and still, though, maintains his passion as a computer programmer and enthusiast, which really, you know, piques my interest because I'm sitting here right now wearing a hat with a propeller on the top of it. If you want to look up geek in the dictionary, there's a picture next to it. As I've said, I'm a Microsoft certified solution developer and nothing makes me happier than an if-then-else statement backed up by a class module and dynamic array. So, with that said... Uh, when Windows 8 and the Microsoft Surface brought the full power of modern PCs to the mobile touchscreen arena, Peter jumped at the chance to finally build the trial presentation software that he'd always wanted. My guest today, coming in from Chicago, where I was yesterday, stuck for about three and a half to four hours in O'Hare Airport, Peter Moore. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm sorry to hear that your experience in Chicago was not pleasant yesterday. It wasn't that it wasn't pleasant, Peter, because I'm going to tell you, I found a place in the C terminal. Uh, you go into the C terminal and you go as you're heading toward the B terminal and you will find a place called Wicker Garden. And Wicker Garden is a new sushi restaurant, full sushi bar, and I enjoyed the hell out of the sushi I had. And you think to yourself, well, sushi in an airport, that's kind of like gas station sushi. But it makes <laughs> sense. Think about it. If it's coming in by plane, where is it going to be the freshest? Ah, that's an excellent point. I have logical thinking. Thank you very yes, much. Indeed. So uh, <laughs> tell, me, tell me a little bit about what's going on, Peter. How did you, how did you I mean, you got to think. Visionary, sanction, trial director, yep. exhibit view, yep. in data's iPad app, um, all the DK Global and their trial touch, yep. all these softwares out there. That's a th those are some pretty big pajamas to put on, my friend. It's it's a it's a crowded market in certain respects. But well, um, tell me your thought. Tell me your thoughts on why did you get into this? There's there's a simple answer to that. It's Windows 8 and the Surface. Um, because it's pretty much just what you said in the intro. Uh, the Surface is a PC in a tablet form, and Windows 8, and, and regardless of you know whether you like it as an operating system or not, it really tried to pioneer the the concept of merging the the PC and the tablet. And to me, trial presentation seemed like just a a really logical um, avenue to uh, to to put onto that platform. And, and so that was the catalyst. So now you've practiced law. You, you've been a practicing attorney. Tell me about your law practice. Yep. Well, it started out, I started out at, at Latham and Watkins doing a lot of IP cases, working with a lot of uh, expert witnesses, um, a lot of videotaped depositions. And so that's really when I started to get interested in this whole field was the idea of the videotaped deposition and, and how that would be presented to the jury. Um, didn't have a chance to take any cases to trial at Latham, but then I moved to a firm uh, called Wildman Herald, Ellen and Dixon, which unfortunately no longer exists in Chicago. They got gobbled up and uh, a couple times over. And then I had a couple of trials, uh, including a jury trial in a patent case, and another trial um, out in Utah involving some uh, corporate governance disputes. So uh, my practice in, at Wildman got pretty diverse, but it was always very high tech oriented. Um, and my uh, uh, personal practice 
involving um, technology grew substantially. So I focused a lot on e-discovery, um, a lot on trial presentation and, and depositions especially, and um, sort of became a resource within the firm for, uh, you know, for the attorneys and clients who had, you know, some needs that um, maybe weren't obvious. I would get them in touch with consultants, uh, trial technologists, et cetera, work very heavily with them. Well, you just um, said right there that you would get in touch with the trial technologist. Did mm -hmm. you not run the tech yourself considering you come from that technical background? I did not run a trial director myself. Um, we did have a consultant to do that. And I did, however, do a lot of the uh, uh, database management, some of the uh, deposition uh, clip creation, that sort of thing. And that was one of the things, specifically the deposition clip creation, that really started my wheel spinning about how this uh, could be better. Um, the reason I didn't run the tech in trial was simply because I didn't think that as an attorney, um, a, a mouse and keyboard interface was really conducive to, um, you know, to, to allowing an attorney to do that at the same time as uh, questioning a witness. It, it didn't seem like uh, it seemed like I had more important things to be worrying about. As well, you're gonna, we're gonna really break your software down in just a minute. But let me ask you, Peter, do you think that with the advent of Windows 8 and coming on Windows 10 and the tablet? PC hybrid being the thing. Do you think that ultimately that is going to replace the smart board? I think it could. I definitely think it could. You know, our uh, our sort of flagship product that we um, like to advertise the most is a 23-inch uh, touchscreen. It's actually not even a tablet. It sits on the table, and it has the same for, uh, form factor as an Elmo. And then I also we also mentioned on the website the 84-inch Surface Hub, which is uh, again definitely designed to replace a, a smart board or, or to fill that role. So I do think that. What kind of feedback have you got? When did Lemony release? We sort of came out of the shadows in February of this year at the Legal Tech Conference in New York. Um, there had been development prior to that, uh, of course. But uh, that was when we launched the website and started making the product available for previews. What kind of feedback have you gotten so far? The, the feedback overwhelmingly has been positive. Um, we've gotten uh, feature requests, many of which we've actually been able to implement. Um, many have come from the trial support side of the of the field. So, for example, there have been um, comments like, "This would help a hot seater more," uh, or "You know, I need to be able to import a thousand documents very quickly." Those were the sorts of uh, feature requests, and and many of which we've actually been able to. Uh, implement since that time. So the people who have used it, the attorneys who have used it, they love it. Um, they uh, they're they're pretty diverse. We've had a couple of uh, of uh, plaintiffs' lawyers use it in court. We've had um, uh, actual op tech operators use it in court. Um, so the feedback's been really really good. Well, you you mentioned something there, and I, I'm I'm which makes me curious. Do you find that your market is more lawyer based and what I mean by that is you want to sell overall to the firm you want to go in and you want the lawyers to run this because you've made it so easy to do so or is your focus on the trial technology consultants like myself and 90 percent of my guests that actually that's what they do for a living is hot seat or is it a little bit of both it, well, it's a lot of both. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that because it, it's easy to get uh, uh, for, for the perception to be out there that, you know, there's either one camp or the other camp, right? That, that there's either, either the really easy tablet apps or there's the really powerful, um, you know, trial directors and, and, and such. We are really trying to uh, merge those two and eliminate the boundary. We want, we need, frankly, the support of both sides of it for this to, to be successful. And so a very big part of our focus is, uh, is and is going to be on the trial technologist side of the equation. Are you yourself a trial technology company, yes or no? Yes. So you will actually take your software and you will go sit hot seat? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, we will not do that. 
Uh, and and you, when I, yeah, and yeah. I, I didn't. I should have phrased better. And I'm sorry, Peter. You can object to the form of my question <laughs> at any point, and I and I will rephrase. Let me ask it again. Yeah. You are a development and software company, not a hot seat company. Correct. We want to be the OEM, as I like to say. There, there you go. So if you want to deal with the end user and be the OEM, do you? What do you think about? The companies out here, uh, I don't want to name any, but the companies who develop software and turn around and, and try to sell themselves and do, do trials with their software. What, what do you think about that? Uh, do, do you find that to be a little bit counterproductive or do you think like I do that, well, you know, I mean, if I developed a piece of software, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use my software with everybody just as well as I want the next guy to use it. Right. It, it's certainly interesting. And it's, it's interesting that you brought that up because one of our first um, reseller partners, and we can, we can talk about that program a little later. Oh, one, of our, one of our first reseller partners actually raised that exact issue with me and wanted to more or less a guarantee that we weren't going to be doing that. And I, and I gave it to him because we don't plan to do that. You're not going to uh, compete. You're not going to compete with the market that you're trying to, to get in. Exactly. I mean, we have to, we, we, you know, we have to give people uh, the right incentives to do business with us uh, otherwise they're not going to so um, it doesn't make any sense to try to do that from my perspective let's jump into the software because this is this is where we're at and of course we have we have done a podcast with on cue uh we talked with eric pubitz uh about on cue uh we've talked with michael caldwell from dk global who has trial touch uh, we have offered an invitation to the guys at Indata to come on at any time they wish. They are allowed to come on the show. I love those guys. Uh, we, have, we have offered Sanction a chance to come out, and we have offered Visionary a chance to come out and talk. And my question to everybody is the same, and I'm going to ask it to you. What makes you different? And the answer to that depends on one thing, which is different from the big boys, the trial directors, and the sanctions, or different from the trial pads and the trial touches. We're very let's different. Let's take it from one both. step. Let's take it one step at a time. Let's take it with. Let's go the big boys first, and then work our way backwards. What sure. makes you different than the big boys? What, what makes us different from them is that we give you guys, the trial technologists, new ways to add value to your clients, new ways to meet your clients' demands that those other tools don't give you. So to the extent that you do have clients who want a more active role, and I'm sure you do, even if you don't know it, the lawyers do want this. Um, We now give you the ability to service that need without sacrificing your business, without handing them the reins completely. The reason that you're not handing them the reins completely is because there is still an immensely powerful um, database creation mechanism that underlies the entire system. So you will spend plenty of time organizing their exhibits, importing their uh, load files, um, organizing their entire exhibit list so that they don't have to. You will spend a lot of time arranging deposition video clips. Uh, we have this queuing system that is, I think is very unique among um, any of the other players that lets you queue up the deposition videos exactly the way you want them to look in advance. So you'll be spending your hours doing that. Um, If you want to have a touchscreen, if you want a hot seat and just use a touchscreen, you can do that. Um, So there's a lot more opportunities to um, add value and uh, meet your clients' needs and demands. Now, you guys are able to support what file types that are coming in? Let's start with documents and work our Mm -hmm. way to video. Mm-hmm. Well, PDFs are the big ones, obviously. Um, any kind of image file format, TIFFs, JPEGs, PINGs, um, et cetera, bitmaps, of course. Um, <clears throat> we can import PowerPoint files right now. We can't import uh, the rest of the Office suite yet. That's simply a, really a business issue. We're looking for the right library to, uh, to incorporate before we do that, but that'll probably come by the end of the year. Um, we support uh, media files. Anything that uh, Windows Media Foundation can support. So that's mainly uh, H.264, MP4, AVI files, QuickTime files. If you have legacy video, we give you a converter also. So that's not an issue if you have MP, MP2 or MP1. 
Um, so really, you know, it really runs the gamut um, in terms of load files, OPT uh, with DAT files. Uh, you can import the metadata from a concordant style DAT file. Um, deposition videos, we support natively the MDB uh, sanction format. And we're also very soon going to be supporting the YesLaw XML standard uh, directly. So you really don't care where the sync comes from because that's not a business you're jumping into. Oh, yeah, definitely not. Uh, we were actually, uh, I spoke to Brian Clune last week actually about how we were going to support their format. Yeah, I had Brian on the show. And, and, you know, Brian's a plethora of information when it comes to video and understanding those formats. And, of course, he's got John Garnett with him who is just a hero when it comes to this kind of stuff. So that's, that's always good. Now, another thing that you do, you can take trial exhibits directly from an e-discovery repository based on the Bates numbers, correct? That's exactly right. Explain to the listeners how that works. So <clears throat> you, start with a, you start with an e-discovery repository that your attorneys have been working on, in, working on for probably months, if not years. When the attorneys have listed out all the trial exhibits they want to use, preferably by Bates number, you, turn, you would turn that as the trial technician, you would turn that into a CSV file. Basically cut and paste, clean it up a little bit, et cetera. In Limine, you would go in, first you would import all of the actual images directly from the load file. So the e-discovery technician would generate a load file based on the Bates numbers that the attorneys had identified for trial exhibits. You import the load file. When that's done, you have Bates numbers. Now your second set of metadata is what matches the base numbers to the trial exhibit lists. Um, you import that as metadata. You map the fields. You say map uh, base number to the base number from the load file, map exhibit ID to the built-in limit A exhibit ID field. When you finish that process and your images have imported, everything has a label on it. Everything is searchable by base number, by exhibit ID, by whatever else was in the metadata. And I can call it up in the presentation mode uh, let's call the presentation mode your second monitor, what the jury sees, right. I right. can pull up by that exhibit ID, correct? That's exactly right. Or by Bates number or by deposition exhibit ID, whatever was in the database before remains in the database. So also one thing that I don't know if anybody else is doing, so I can't speak clearly to this and maybe you can. Uh, and I apologize in advance if another software out there is doing this, but I've not seen it. And that is, you guys are able to export your exhibits to the JAR system, which is the jury evidence recording system, which is widely mandated in federal trials. And it's getting more and more steam as it goes. And you're the only one I've seen so far that actually advertises exporting in that format. Um, I don't know if anybody else does it, and I apologize to all the other companies if you do, and I didn't mention you. But that's something that you guys do as well, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, it was a suggestion actually from um, our, our, the paralegal that is on our team. Um, and he's more than a paralegal, actually. He's a veteran trial technician himself. And it, he brought it up. And he had been through several trials where they had had to do that manually uh, by renaming the PDF file. So believe it or not, it was actually a, a pretty uh, simple feature to add to the software. Uh, it was pretty much a matter of exporting the PDFs with the right name and uh, exporting the, the uh, text file. It's similar to a DAT file that they require. So not a lot of effort, but a huge time saver for the people who have been through it and now don't have to, don't have to do it manually. Now, there are a couple of things that are very interesting to me that you're doing right here, and I want to jump in depth on these. Uh, I have done something in the state of Arkansas that had not been done. I was the first to do it in 2009. Uh, I did it recently in a trial in which a judge wrote me a glowing letter uh, that I was very thankful for and humbled by. You can set up Lemony to let witnesses testify via Skype and see the same exhibits the jury does. Explain that to me. We, we can. Uh, we have not done it yet, but we prepared to do it because there was a client request um, to, to make it happen. So we investigated doing it, and unfortunately, they didn't do it. But yes, we can. Well, I, Here's will, how be, it works. I will be your crash test dump because <laughs> if we, whatever we can do in trial, we can also do in depositions. And I've got a lawyer right now true. that, oh my God, my dogs are killing me. This is why I don't do these at home, but tonight was one of those I wanted to be at home. No. Uh, I don't think anybody's at the door, so... 
they're just going nuts. I, I started the whole thing with that with that uh, ad in my ear, so it's probably my fault. No, 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 no. You're fine. You're fine. All right. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'll be your crash test dummy on that deal because I've got a lawyer who does nothing but Skype depositions right now because we're all over the country. So I, if I can do that exact same thing in trial, there's no reason that I couldn't do it in deposition. So tell me more about the theory behind that. Does limiting need to be on both machines, I take it? Lemonade does not need to be on both machines. Lemonade would be running on the machine that's, um, it would, well, in your case, would be the deposition room. You, you alluded to the, the second screen. I, I, I want to just talk about that for a second because it's sort of integral to this, to this topic in particular. So that second screen, it is a second monitor. It's a second window. And uh, it is not, obviously, the same. It uh, doesn't show the same information as the, presenter, the presenter's screen. The presenter's screen has the the file folders and the thumbnails and all of that. So that second screen is something that you can, in Skype, you can set uh, which of your monitors you actually want to broadcast to the other person. So it's like a screen sharing. It's very similar to GoToMeeting or Citrix or anything like that. So you set it up for screen sharing. You set it up to share your second screen, the audience view as I call it, with the remote person. The remote person then sees the presentation and you in the deposition room you could set it up so that you could see their their video, their talking head, um, again via Skype. So no, they don't need to have Lemay. Absolutely wonderful idea. I think that's definitely uh, definitely has some possibilities uh, to be used for people all the way across the board. Next, you can set up Lemon A. I I say Lemony. Lemon A. It's kind of like <laughs> Vordire or Voidir, you know. Exactly. Like, where are you from? Uh, right. Potato, potato. But set up Lemonade to broadcast the audience view to tablets rather than TVs, which is a great low-cost yes, alternative to wiring a courtroom with audiovisual equipment. Take me through that, Peter. Well, there's a company called Splashtop, uh, a great uh, group of people that we've spoken to several times uh, about this in particular. Um, there, the software that would be used for this particular functionality is Splashtop Classroom. And it is software that they use in classrooms uh, every day right now. Teachers are using this to uh, broadcast their, uh, their lessons to students instead of chalkboards. And, you know, what is a trial if not a, a teaching endeavor? And so the, the fact that, you know, classroom software would be used for this is, makes a lot of sense, I think. So you set the Splashtop uh, server, basically. I think they call it Streamer. But you set up the Splashtop server on the device running Lemonade, and you set it to broadcast the audience view or the presentation view uh, to the tablets. And then each of the tablets just needs to either download a client or they can also access it through a web browser. Now let's, let's be fair here, and I need to be fair to your company. What we've covered through these features that we've talked about are features that are limited to the certified Lemony resellers, law firms with in-house technology support departments who have purchased enterprise-wide classic edition licenses, and they have access to these uh, to these features that we've talked about here. And the question I have, and and you know, I don't know if you're going to quote directly from from your uh, from your user guide, but why aren't these features available to everyone across the board? It, it, it's not so that it's not so much that they're not available. For example, we couldn't stop anyone from doing from from installing Splashtop Classroom, but we wouldn't be supporting it directly um, without a support technician being involved. Because, you know, we learned this actually at our first trial. I mean, we knew this was going to be the case, but it really hit home. People are not going to have a good experience with our software or with any software if they try to bite off more than they can chew if they're not well supported. So if they tried to do something like broadcast to the tablets and they tried to do that themselves, there are, there are too many things that could go wrong, too many um, configuration issues that um, really require a professional to be as assisting them. And the lawyers, as, as I say, and as, as I think I've, I've heard you say, and as everyone says, they have better things to be worrying about than IT issues. They should be focusing on practicing. Well, that's exactly right. And let's face facts. If something goes wrong in the courtroom, software is going to get the blame. Of course. Exactly. I knew that my, the people who used us at our first trial in particular, I knew they weren't going to have a positive experience if they didn't have support. 
and they exactly would have blamed the software, and I have no interest in that. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, Peter. How are you, how are you making sure that the people who uh, get your software are properly trained, properly using the software, know the available features, and, and have some confidence out there with it? How are you dealing with that? Mm -hmm. Well, for uh, law firms and uh, trial technology professionals, we have a, a, a pretty thorough training session uh, for them. Um, anyone who signs up with this as a, as a trial technology specialist or any law firm that signs an enterprise agreement gets at least a four-hour training session where we go through all of those detailed, very detailed, those powerful features about um, importing documents via metadata and load files and uh, things of that nature. If there are teams that want to do things like the witness via Skype or um, broadcast a tablet, we will be there to support them you know, and to walk them through that. Um, again, presumably that they're being supported by a professional. As far as the average user, say the, uh, just the lawyer who just wants to use this in court himself or herself, um, we are available to answer questions. There's a, a phone number uh, they, that uh, they can call. There's uh, email addresses they can use. We've gotten cold calls uh, from people asking for support, and they've always been answered. So we're here uh, really to help anyone. And we are building, you know, as we, as we grow, we're going to be hiring more support staff you know, for that exact purpose. Um, but you know, the overall, the real key is to get the support community um, to get their buy-in. Because we would rather have all of the attorneys be supported by professionals. You know, there's already a vast network of, of folks out there who do this for a living. There's no reason for us to get involved and reinvent the wheel on that. So the more support partners we can get, the broader of a base of customers uh, we can have using our software and having a good experience with it. What are y'all doing as far as like a beta program? Do you guys have any of the, uh, the seasoned hot seat uh, ladies and gentlemen out here, uh, do you have a pretty good beta group or is that something that you are currently looking for? Is somebody to be able to kick the tires, so to speak? I think we've had a lot of, a lot of tire kicking. Like I said, we've been through uh, five or six trials. Obviously, it's not you know the hundreds that some of the other tools have been through. We're obviously brand new. Um, there's no question about that. But um, we've had a lot of really good feedback from people. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of feature requests that we were able to, to add. We have um, a couple of trial technology support folks that uh, we're working very closely with. Um, one of whom has actually signed on officially, a couple more that we're uh, very optimistic about getting in the next uh, month here. And it's, it's, it's growth. I mean, we're going to be growing. We're small right now. Um, the larger we can build that, uh, that network of, of uh, support technicians, uh, not only will our customers be better supported, but the software will, will be better as well because they'll find things that they want changed or that could work better um, and so forth. If I was to ask you, and I'm going to, <laughs> what is the one thing that sets you apart from everybody else? What, what is that tangible or maybe an intangible it factor that sets you apart from everyone else in the industry. What is it? In 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 one sentence, what is it? Mm -hmm. It's in my view, it's making enabling a true partnership between the technology side and the and the lawyer side. Um, it's bringing back the concept of Elmo's and things like that, where the lawyer really was controlling the show in court, but nonetheless had powerful technology behind him. Um, we, I believe, strike a better balance than anyone else in that regard in giving the lawyers the, the ability to have their fate in their hands, to, to control the presentation to the extent they want to, and yet not have to sacrifice the power of modern technology uh, that's available um, 
right now only to only to the few, frankly, to the to the small to the largest cases, the um, highest paying clients, etc. We talked about That's the big, we, we talked about the big dogs. Now let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the iPad or any tablet, uh, any any personal device. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about the Surface Tab. Tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing uh, in the area of these personal devices. In in terms of the the functionality that, uh -huh. that we have on the yep. touch screen side. Yep. 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 What makes you What makes you different there? Yeah. I mean, it's it's power. It's it's simply power. Um, look, the iPad is is a great device. Uh, you know, it's fun, but it just wasn't designed to be a professional's device. Uh, the hardware specs aren't there. The uh, the operating system is just not designed for it. So, the the Surface and the Windows 8 touchscreen devices. That in and of itself is a huge difference, and I, and you know that's not our doing; that's Microsoft's doing. So I mean, they deserve a lot of the credit, but that is the huge difference. You have with us diversity of devices, as we talked about: the tablets, the the tabletop, the Surface Hub, uh, which is not possible on any of the other app platforms. Um, we have deposition videos, synchronized deposition video support, which um, I I don't believe is on any of the other platforms. Um, like you said, I try not to, uh, you know, apologies in advance if I'm, if I'm mistaken, but I don't believe it is. So the bottom line is we give you a PC, we give you the same power that you would have if you were running a PC application. We give that to you in the touchscreen format. How dangerous is the touchscreen? Dangerous. <laughs> you mean how hard is it to screw up? Uh, how dangerous is it? I've I have seen, you know. Oh, I didn't mean to touch there. Oh, I double cl I double clicked when I meant to single click. Oh, I need to uh -huh. right click. Uh, uh huh. I gotcha. I gotcha. Well, uh, we have an interesting feature that I think uh, speaks directly to that. If we talked about how the presenters the presenters screen, your screen is different from the audience's screen. Well. The audience doesn't actually see changes that you make until they're set, generally speaking. So if you move a document, if, if you like accidentally brush against it and it, and it you know, jitters a little bit, audience doesn't see that. Um, second point is that it's extremely easy to undo anything that affects the, the visual. So if you made a call out accidentally, just hit undo, it's gone. Um, Third point, if you are the extremely cautious type, which I know a lot of lawyers and technicians are, uh, we have a pause button. So you can hit pause. The audience's screen is frozen. And you can set up your display exactly the way you want it. And when you're finished, you hit resume. And then the audience display um, once again reflects what was on your screen. So we, we certainly had in mind the possibility of uh, operator error and did uh, everything we could think of to minimize it. I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh, but you know that's kind of what I do on here, and I, I ask the hard questions and, and things like that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. This thing has been in development for two years. What features currently are you lacking but looking forward to implementing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are certainly a few. Um, I, I think the main one, as I mentioned before, is uh, having a little bit of a broader uh, import file support uh, or you know, file format support that we can import. Uh, as I mentioned, we don't have the full Office suite covered yet. I would like to be able to pull in, and here's a great example of something I want to be able to do. I want to be able to pull in a native Excel because, as we all know, the Excel files, they, don't, they image out terribly usually, and so a lot of a lot of times they're produced in native format anyway. Um, I would like to be able to pull in an Excel chart and have it look really nice and be able to use that as a trial exhibit. Um, that'll, be, that'll, be, uh, that'll be soon. Again, it's not a technological problem. It's a business problem. We're just looking for the right, um, the right tool to do that because we're not going to develop that, obviously. Um, I would say that if, if you are the type that wants to have every single document in the case that ever touched the case in in the tool, and you know you have a hundred thousand documents. I think one of the other packages advertised that they had a hundred thousand documents. 
uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that with our tool. It's a it's an entirely local database. It's meant to be fast and agile. Um, that said, I mean we've gotten ten thousand or more uh, with no problem. Well, but your I, software your software had a trial that had fifty thousand documents and performed flawlessly. Uh, fifty thousand well fifty thousand pages. Fifty thousand yeah, pages. Okay. I, you know sometimes there's ambiguity between when we talk about documents or pages. Um, I, I'm I'm talking about um, documents. So you know ten thousand documents is fine. A hundred thousand pages is fine. But you know, if we started talking about the millions, I would not endorse that. Um, well, and it's good that you're it's good that you're honest about it. And that you know that's one area that I think a lot of people, you know, and this is this is strictly my opinion. <clears throat> so I'll put the disclaimer out there that uh, it's my opinion and my opinion only. <clears throat> and as you hear things falling around here in the room, that's because uh, you know my opinion knocks things off the wall because it really doesn't matter. <laughs> But when you develop software and you're new to the market, here's what I see happening. Uh, a piece of software comes out and you get an old dog like myself that comes in and tries the software. And I am used to one or two functions that I use in Trial Director or I used in OnCube. And I take this new software, and I try to do that same function, and it won't do it. And so I say, oh, well, this is garbage. <laughs> and I really, I don't do that because I, I try to drive everything and really give it all it's due and see where, it, where it's strong and where it's weak. But I think user change is one of the biggest problems out here. Somebody that's used to driving the car a certain way, they go a new way to they go an old way to work every day, and then now they've got a new way to go and they kind of wig out. So, do you see that have you have you seen some of that as you're as you're beginning to grow and as you're beginning to hit the marketplace that some people will write the software off really not giving it a chance? I I don't know if anyone's written it off for that reason. I I hope not. I do know that there has been um, uh, the bottom line is you can't be everything to everyone, right? And right. I mean that's obvious. And uh, the interesting thing for me was that um, a lot of that pressure has come, in fact, from from the trial technologist side. Oh, can we? You know, it can't. It doesn't do this. Can it do that? Can it do that? So we've gotten that for sure, and we've tried to accommodate it when it made sense to accommodate it. Um, you know, I'm flattered that uh, a veteran trial technologist would consider using us in a hot seat capacity because, frankly, when I started the project, that was not what I had in mind. It sort of, the, 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 the notion that it could do that sort of evolved over time. So I'm always, I'm always flattered when I, when I get that feedback. But I also say, look, you know, that's still not the ultimate purpose of the product. The ultimate purpose of the product is, is to have more of an equality between the the lawyer and the operator. So um, we are happy to accommodate that those sort of feature requests. We will uh, accept that, you know, pre pressure. It's not a bad thing, but we'll accept that pressure when it makes sense, when it fits in sort of the strategic vision that we have. Um, will, will anyone dismiss it because it can't do something? I'm, I'm sure that that's going to happen, and you know, that's something that we will we will accept and and live with. But what we won't do is we're not going to turn the product into you know, trial director or sanction. Right. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I completely understand where you're coming from because I remember the first time, you know, uh, fresh out of college, uh, fresh off my Microsoft certs and I did my first SDLC and I went through, uh, my first cradle to grave development, uh, from initial development of the system, uh, you know, the system development life cycle and all the way through. And if, if you let the creep set in, you know as well as I do, you're just going to be spinning your spinning your wheels. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you, you know, it it, have to, it has to be released at some point. I mean, otherwise it'll be in beta forever. Let's talk about the pricing. And you guys are doing uh, doing some things that are kind of a hybrid. Uh, you have two versions. You have a modern edition and you have a classic edition. What's the difference? Well, it, it's very simple. The modern edition is the Windows 8.1 app, or, or specifically a Windows runtime app. It's, it's the underlying technology, bottom line. So the modern edition is the touchscreen-based uh, 
product that is requires Windows 8.1 or higher and uh, doesn't require, but generally you would use it with a touch screen. It would be silly not to. Um, classic is a, is a classic Windows desktop application. Uh, it's a .NET application. It's something that you can install on your Office PCs. Um, you can, uh, uh, it requires Windows 7 or higher. So it's, it's, uh, it's a classic application. In terms of functionality, they're very, very similar. The Modern Edition's big advantage really is the touch capability. Classic, on the other hand, can do some things that Modern can't do. And all of those differences are really based on the operating system. Microsoft won't let you do certain things in the Windows runtime platform. Um, for example, if you want to import a PowerPoint, you need to do that in Classic because we actually communicate with PowerPoint on your computer in order to render those slides for you. Um, <clears throat> so that's the difference. And then, of course, as you touched upon, there's, there's difference in pricing and, and who the product is actually made available to and uh, what channels uh, the products are sold in. Um, the modern edition is intended really to be sold via the technology support, litigation support channel, um, with the exception of very small cases, uh, such as solo uh, practitioner cases, personal injury cases. Um, in that case, we'll, we'll do a direct sale. But generally, modern is for, the, is for the larger trials for the supported teams. Let's talk about classic edition. How bloated are you? Bloated by uh, uh, software standards, you, you know, mean? Yeah, I, I do. That's exactly it, what I mean. It's lean. It, it's it's very lean. Um, it, it the the memory footprint it, on average is probably about uh, 150 megabytes. Believe it or not, um, it's multi-threaded entirely. So um, when you use it, you it, it is highly responsive. It feels like the touchscreen app, and the the reason for that is because 90% of the code is the same. Um, actually, <clears throat> so it's not bloated at all. It's a it's a very lean app. Then let's take that in a different direction when we talk about bloat. Yeah. PDF versus TIFF. Yeah. What what are you seeing as responsive time frame uh, one versus the other inside of the classic edition? Well, we will um, we will import PDFs and convert them to TIFFs on the fly, um, or to PNGs actually um, under under the hood PNG files. Uh, we will convert them at the time of import. Why would you Why would you convert to portable network graphic versus the tagged image file format? Yeah, that is one of the reasons why the responsiveness is so is so high in in both classic and runtime, because and modern, because uh, PNG files Windows is optimized to to load them. I'm going to get really geeky now. Go, but go ahead, get geeky <laughs> because I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Come, that's the first time I've ever heard that, and I'm wondering. If coming in PNG, uh, and for the listeners, I said portable network graphics, that's what PNG stands for. You have three uh, very distinct uh, files out here. You have the PNG, which is portable network graphics. You have the JPEG, which everybody is familiar with, which is Joint Picture Experts Group, the JPEG. And then you have the GIF or GIF, whatever you want to call it. And so... To he or, and then you have bitmap, but who uses BMPs anymore? So my question is, would you sacrifice quality with a PNG over TIFF? No, uh, it's, it's lossless. PNG is lossless. Um, the, reason, the reason we use PNG is because uh, it is much more efficient on the Windows side to uh, pull in a PNG file onto a DirectX surface. And that's why I said I'm going to get really geeky. <laughs> it's a low-level programming thing. It, it's, it's transparent to the user. The user isn't going to know the difference between PNG and TIFF, but it, it's a huge performance boost. Wow. That's the, that's the first I've heard of it, so there you're doing <laughs> something that nobody else is doing. And that conversion is all being done in the back end, right? Um, it happens uh, at the time of import. Um, we, uh, I was actually intrigued by your uh, interview with Eric from uh, OnQ about how they import in the background. Um, that's a, that's the a really good the idea. Rel the relative pathing. Um, well, that that too, but we actually do that too. But I meant the they convert their TIFFs in the background while you're working. I'm sorry, they convert their PDFs, and I, I thought that was an intriguing idea. We convert them at the time you import them, so you'll spend a few minutes, you know, waiting for a large import. But um, once it's done, it's done. So, with that said, 
what is happening for the user in terms of in terms of file size space consideration which mm-hmm. honestly it's 2015 man i mean 1998 99 up to 05 we were worried about drive space we were worried about having things duplicated we were using canopus and we were using um, you know, magna chassis with uh, <laughs> the the OptiBase boards, and we were using Digital Rapids boards, and we were converting to MPEG one and getting them to six hundred meg an hour <laughs> because we were worried about file size. Well, now nobody really cares because yeah. you got you got two terabyte solid state under the hood. What do you care? Uh, I guess That's right. what you're doing is you're keeping your native PDF, and then you guys are converting on the backside, and the user never sees it, right? Yeah, that's right. And the the file sizes. You know, they're they're not as big as you might think. Right. A, 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 a decent size, a mid-sized trial database with all the images is going to be a few gigs. It's not unreasonable. Sure. Maybe ten gigs tops. You know, so you can't burn it to a DVD. Well, that, I mean, that's I'm, not an carrying, issue. I'm, I'm carrying around two terabytes in my pocket. So yeah. you know, on, on an external Western Digital Passport. So yeah. you know, I, I'm not really too concerned about file spe- file size, and I don't think anybody else is either. I just think a lot of the uh, veterans in the game. They've got that file size mindset, and it's like, well, I don't want two copies of it on my machine. Well, hell, man, you can have six copies on your machine. It's not going to affect anything. You're not going to see the difference. Let's talk That's about right. let's talk about price. Yeah, um, I want to go with classic first. You guys are doing the uh, Lemonade Classic PC Edition single user subscription, one year, four hundred ninety nine dollars. That's right. What was your methodology behind the pricing? Um, basically, market. I mean, it's. It's uh, it is a powerful presentation tool in its own right, and if people want to use it in that capacity, um, then that is fairly in line, I think, with with how some of the other products are priced. Not you know not exactly the same, obviously, but fairly in line. But I want to emphasize something, and and you know, we might be getting to it. But uh, classic is also um, really a preparation tool that is uh, meant to be used with. The touchscreen, you know, it, as a complement to the touchscreen device, and when it is purchased in that capacity, it's actually free. So if if a, if a lawyer were to hire you, for example, to uh, provide them uh, a modern edition device like like the Dell touchscreen and supply their trial database and do all their deposition clips, etc., that client would have access to the Classic Edition on their own PCs for the duration of that engagement. Right. At no extra I, I, charge. Right. And I, and I understand that. Let me ask yeah. you on your website. It says Lemony Modern Edition, short term tablet rental from, meaning starting at, $599. Tell me about that. Right. Right. That is actually what I alluded to earlier about um, small cases, uh, solo practitioners who might want to use this, criminal defense attorneys who might want to use this, who couldn't afford you know, to hire technicians and, and wouldn't uh, generally. Um, that is marketed to them. You're going to create the trial in a box. Ex- exactly. Thank you, because I, I heard your interview with um, Ted Brooks. With, uh, Ted Brooks. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, except my well, hey, well, he, hey, let me tell you, Bro- no. Brooksy is my boy, but he did not create or coin or copyright that term. So, well, he coined <laughs> it, but he didn't copyright it. So we're allowed to use it. There you go, uh, Ted. I'll send you a check later. There you right, go. Go ahead. So, so what you're doing there is, hey, we'll build your database, we'll get it on the touch screens, and we'll support it. Well, I actually was was about to say, uh, no, we we actually still are not going to be building their databases. They look, the import functions are very very simple. If if they only have a handful of documents, like they would at a case like this, they can import them. The the trial in a box, and that's why I was about to stop myself. The trial in a box concept I found intriguing because that's more along the lines of what we are trying to do with the uh, consultant partners is that uh, you will build their database, you will get the billable hours for that, support them, hold their hands, train them, and then you will hand them this beautiful touchscreen device with a bow on it that's going to make them look like a badass in front of the jury. I've made a decision that I'm going to use Lemony. I want to do it and I want to get it on my machine and I'm going to buy, I'm going to go ahead and buy the modern edition and I'm going to pay my $5.99 or whatever I'm going to pay what kind of support am I getting? Do I have to pay extra for support? Tell me a little bit from the user standpoint. I've decided, you know what, Peter? I want to go with you guys. I want to give you a try, and I want to run with you. What am I getting for my buck? Well, if you're talking about the, the $599 package for the, the two-week rental, 
you'll get uh no i just want to i just want to i just want to buy i want to buy the software i want to have oh. it on my machine like i have trial director on queue sanction visionary whatever okay. i want to i want to use your software and i want to have another tool in my toolbox what do i get for my money because i know that and i'm going to use on queue as the example with on queue i can pay a monthly fee and included in my monthly fee is the software unlimited support and my user license and i can use it on up to two machines which of course everybody's got a laptop and a trial laptop they've got a backup going somewhere so what do i get with lemony on this deal well the first thing i should probably say is that uh first of all if you're a reseller partner or consultant partner with us you're not paying anything to have our software on your machines there are zero upfront fees licensing fees uh, for trial technology consultants. Instead, uh, you will bill out, presumably will bill out to the client, but either way, the only fees are associated with actual billable work. So once you start an engagement, um, you will, you will uh, be invoiced based on the amount of time, the type of device, um, et cetera, that is being loaned out to the client. Explain, I'm sitting hot seat, what am I loaning <laughs> out to the client? Explain that to me. Well, if you, well, if you want to, to be clear, if you want to sit hot seat, you probably wouldn't be using Modern Edition. You could just buy a Classic Edition license. Okay, so let's talk. Let's talk about the Classic Edition. Okay. So with the Classic Edition for my four hundred ninety nine dollars, yeah. What am I getting in terms of support and yeah. training and things like that? Sure. Um, the, there's unlimited email support. Uh, if we need to have a phone call or a Skype call, we'll have a Skype call either with myself or with someone else on our support team. Um, you get unlimited updates. There are no, uh, there's no, you know, waiting for the next version, that sort of thing. Uh, the updates actually just push out to you um, automatically if you if you want them. Um, so yeah, if you if you want an admin training, we call it an admin training. If you want to be doing things like pulling in the um, the metadata, the load files, etc., that is a, a longer program. And so far, we have been offering that to either the enterprises or the or the consultant partners. Uh, however, you know we're happy to to do that. You know, for others, we probably would have to charge a little bit for that, but um, that would be very in depth. But standard support to just do the sorts of things that the lawyers would be doing—that's just included. Tell me about your support, and the, and and we're going to close on on this and uh, talking about this topic. Tell me about your support because I hear everybody talking about how they've got the best support in the industry. And uh, uh, some of them are a little bit suspect, and some of them are really good, and some of them are absolutely terrible. But where do you feel like right now, Peter, you stand on tech support? And I know it's easy for you to be really good at it right now because you're grassroots. But right. where, what is your vision as the lead dog and the buck stops with you? What is your vision on tech support, and where do you think you guys rank? Well, as you said, it's easy to be really good at support when we're when we're small. So I am not going to brag, you know, at this point. Ask me when we're when we're big, <laughs> you know, how good we are. But I, I think we're really good. I I, res I personally respond to a lot of emails. Um, I have two others that uh, help as well. Um, we're brand new. We are uh, we're actually uh, uh, in the process of starting the the angel fundraising process. Um, and uh, we're growing. That's one of our first priorities: is to grow the support network. Um, as the demand increases, we'll have more folks uh, involved in that process. But you know, my my intent is that a customer will always be able to reach a human being uh, one way or another. If it's if it's not by email, then it's by phone or by Skype. Um, and if they have a bug report or a feature request. That gets certainly a bug report. I mean, that gets top priority. Um, there's a there's a, a reporting system that you can opt into that automatically reports, uh, you know, an, an exception. You know, anything that anything that doesn't go perfect, and that literally goes right to my mailbox. Um, and I and I take them extremely seriously. So um, I think we're good, and we're going to strive. You know, we're going to strive to be the best, just like everyone strives to be the best. Um, we're going to do it. There's a lot to be said for being able to talk to the main person at the company. And, you know, one thing I've prided myself on with my company always in all these years is that I am always going to be accessible. And whether it's you or 
you know, your partner, Will Williford or whoever, if somebody wants to reach out to you, how accessible are you? Well, I, I answer my email pretty, pretty religiously. Um, I, uh, I'll give my cell phone number to certainly to, uh, to, uh, trial technology, uh, partners. Um, and if, if, uh, well, in trial techs, me, trial yeah. techs don't need you till they need you. Exactly. And, and that that's the and the time they need you is when they're standing out in the lobby of a courthouse because something went wrong with a witness uh, an hour ago and they need to get a hold of you. Yeah. And that's that's where that's where companies strive to be better or, or want to be better is in that area right there because honestly, I don't need you till I need you unless I'm texting you to say, "Hey, I'm going to be in Chicago next week." I mean, you know, we, we really don't have to talk a lot, but when I need you, I re- it's kind of like having insurance. You know, you pay premiums all those right. years, and if you don't have a wreck, then you've thrown your money in the fireplace, but it's good peace of mind to know that you've got the CEO, the main guy, uh, the main gal, the main whoever on, on speed dial. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if we'll magically appear like the State Farm agent, but, uh, you know, I, I've look. I've been through trials on the other side of it, right? And I and I've seen things go wrong, and it and I know how it feels. And you know, I take it extremely personally, and we all do. We're we're really proud of this product, and um, we want everybody who tries it to have the best experience they can have. If they need help, we just want to give them the help they need and and get them going. Well, and if something goes wrong, heaven forbid, we're going to do everything we can to fix it. Well. For everybody out there that wants to uh, take a look at your software, L-E-G-I-S-T-E-K, Logistec.com, or you can Google Lemony, L-I-M-I-N-E, and uh, check out the software. And what's the best way to get a hold of you, Peter? Um, they can email uh, Lemony at Logistec.com, and that'll go to a couple of us, and we will be delighted to answer any questions they have. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, and as we close today... Uh, while we were recording the show, I got my UPS package from iPro, and a, and a big thanks to my friend Kimothy Taylor. I've known Kim a lot of years, and Kim sent me a coffee cup and a shirt, told me to wear it proudly, uh, sent me a, a, a great uh, group of iPro things, sent me a hat uh, and some swag. I've got an iPro pin so I'm all set now, and I want to I want to certainly thank him. And a big thanks to Michael Caldwell, who sent me a great note. Uh, I had Michael on the show um, a couple, three podcasts ago, and he sent me a great note. And I'm, I'm always uh, grateful and humbled by people, like I said, listening to the show and even wanting to come on the show and talk with me. And I say to the trial techs out there and the paralegals and the lawyers that listen to this, and I thank you all for listening. I thank you for the download rates. I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to listen to me run my mouth for an hour. But uh, go out there and check this software out. Give it a test run. Give it a try. See if you like it. But give it a fair shake. Get a hold of uh, Peter and say, hey, here's what I'm planning to do. Can you, can you give me a little walkthrough? And I'm sure he'd be willing to take your call. So until next week, for my guest, Peter Moore from Logistec, I'm Rob Helt. 